Okay, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, we are really excited to host Congresswoman Lauren Underwood uh, for what we think is gonna be a really exciting conversation about uh, environment and energy issues at the federal level. Um, my name is Brian Gill. I'm the Federal Policy Director for the Illinois Environmental Council. Um, I will be your MC for the event today. Um, right now, environmental and energy issues are at the forefront of the state, national, and international conversation. In its latest scientific report, the UN issued a Code Red for Humanity and reminded us that failure to act on climate is not an option. The silver lining is that, scientists say, a catastrophe can be avoided if the world acts fast. There is hope that deep cuts in the emissions of greenhouse gases can stabilize rising temperatures. Uh, in Springfield and across Illinois, we have news to celebrate as of today. Uh, the Illinois House and Senate have both passed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, also known as SB 2408. Uh, we anticipate the governor to sign the bill on Wednesday. Uh, there will be um, uh, there will be more work in the days and the weeks and the years to come to make this vision a reality. But to partially quote uh, Joe Biden when he was vice president, this is a big deal. Um, I imagine many folks on this call were involved in pushing their representatives in the right direction, showing public support at the right times and applying pressure when it was needed. This couldn't have been done without all of you. So uh, thank you for your tireless advocacy and support uh, on this. We'll hear more about uh, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act in a little bit. Uh, meanwhile, in Washington, there is ongoing debate on both how to address the problems facing us, as well as the opportunities that action can present. Today's focus will be on federal investments in the clean energy, in clean energy jobs, environmental justice, and combating the climate crisis. To answer your questions on what is happening at the federal government on these issues, we are thrilled to host Congresswoman Lauren Underwood from Illinois' 14th district, who has been a champion on these issues. Thank you to all of the co-hosts for the event, the Blue Green Alliance, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, the Environmental Defenders of McHenry County, the Sierra Club, and the League of Conservation Voters. Before we turn things over to the Congresswoman, I wanna give our hosts a few minutes each uh, to tell you about their organizations and what they are currently working on. As I mentioned, I work for the Illinois Environmental Council. IEC advocates for public policies that create healthy environments across Illinois, clean water, clean energy, conservation, waste reduction, and more. We primarily focus on state and local policy, but we also engage at the federal level. IEC coordinates over 100 affiliate member organizations to share resources, mobilize supporters, and respond quickly to the most pressing issues facing the environment in Illinois. Members of our team were a big part of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act negotiations. Uh, one of those members uh, is Colleen Smith, who is the Deputy Executive Director of IEC. And I'd like to turn it over to her to uh, talk a little bit about some of that work and um, uh, and, and what it means for Illinois. Um, and Colleen, I also see that um, JC uh, Kibbe from uh, NRDC is on, who is also a big part of these negotiations. So I will leave it to you two uh, to talk about this a little bit more. Thank you so much, Brian, and I will be brief. I would love to turn it over to my, my dear friend and partner, JC at NRDC. Um, but I will just say thank you again to the people that I know are listening who have turned out time and time again in support of the historic Climate and Equitable Jobs Act we just passed, um, and certainly grateful to uh, Congresswoman Underwood and her team for being a champion on these issues broadly, um, as we know that this is going to take local, state, and federal work to deliver the climate action we need. Um, at a very high level, the type of work that we just did to get this bill done wouldn't have been possible without years of organizing and guaranteeing that communities' vision for clean energy futures, 
the support that we know, renewable energy, uh, workforce development, clean transportation, reducing air pollution, and delivering benefits in two communities most often left out of those conversations and already disadvantaged uh, and burdened by environmental pollution. Um, that those are the types of things we needed to do to get this bill done. And that's what it's going to take to deliver on federal climate action as well. I know you'll hear a lot about that this evening, but if what JC is going to say next really inspires you for what we just did in Illinois, um, know that it took a lot of hard work, a lot of people saying time and time again that we had to pass the strongest climate bill, that it had to have equity at its core, that we didn't spend all of this time talking to every part of the state uh, to not deliver on the future that people really deserve. Um, and again, I'm really grateful for that first step <laughs> being passed. And now we look to the signature and implementation and how that relates to um, what is going to come from the federal government uh, as we look at that intersection. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to JC Kibbe to talk a little bit more about the bill. Thanks, Colleen. Um, I'm having a little trouble with my video here, Brian. Not, not sure if you're having any luck with that on your end, but um, I will uh, just say a few words about, I think, what you led us into, which is kind of the incredible uh, work that we're coming off of in Illinois right now. Um, today, we just passed uh, out of the Illinois Senate uh, after passing it out of the Illinois House uh, on last Thursday, uh, the uh, Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, uh, which is one of the most ambitious pieces of climate legislation in the country. It makes Illinois the first uh, state in the Midwest to move to a 100% emissions-free power sector, which we have to have by 2045 uh, under the bill. Uh, and I think really importantly, it also has really, really substantial investments um, in disadvantaged communities. These are communities that are disproportionately uh, where people of color live, disproportionately uh, working class uh, and poor people uh, who have been disproportionately impacted by the pollution from fossil fuel plants and by the effects of climate change, but haven't seen the benefits of the dirty energy economy. And we wanna make sure that they are getting the benefits of the clean energy economy. So we're prioritizing uh, cleaner air and emissions reductions in those environmental justice communities. And we're also uh, investing to make sure that there are those economic opportunities there. And that looks like job training, in those communities that looks like support for uh, small businesses, not only to start them, but to grow them. And those investments total uh, more than $115 million a year in this bill. And, uh, and that's unprecedented so far um, in the country. And so we're really proud and excited about that. Um, and that didn't just come out of thin air, that came out of years of work with environmental justice partners like the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, Blacks and Green and others at the table actually designing the policy and fighting for this legislation uh, alongside all of us. So we're moving to 100% carbon-free energy. Uh, we're investing in disadvantaged communities that have been most impacted. And we're also supporting those communities that are uh, impacted by the decline. And now I'm on video here. So I'm in the car actually coming back from Springfield right now. Um, that are impacted by the decline of fossil fuels. So communities where their uh, coal plants and coal mines are shutting down. Most of these are being driven uh, by market forces. That's been true for the last 10 years. And when these plants close, especially in smaller towns that can have a real impact on their tax base uh, and, and the, you know, the vitality of the town. So we're providing replacement for those property taxes. We're providing support for economic development. We're providing rights and uh, job retraining and other resources for workers that are displaced from these plants. And that's to the tune of $40 million a year. And so never before in the U.S. have these kind of investments been made in the communities that are impacted by fossil fuels and by climate change. And I think why this matters for our conversation today is that it sets the stage for the conversation we're having right now at the federal level, that climate action does not exist in a vacuum, that when we talk about acting on climate change, it has to include support for the most vulnerable uh, communities. It has to include good jobs and making sure that people have pathways to those, as well as substantially and quickly growing clean energy, reducing our emissions and acting on climate change. And those things go hand in hand. 
And so when I look at what's being discussed in the reconciliation bill right now that I and my other colleagues at NRDC and many others here are working on, I think we see a lot of those same, uh, same themes that we're so excited about in Illinois. Um, so uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk a bit about that. Glad to be here tonight and I will pass it off to the next speaker. Thank you, JC. Um, incredible work that you, Colleen, and uh, many others uh, did to get this one over the line. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, John Paul from the Bricklayers Union. Um, John Paul, you should be able to toggle your video on and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good evening. My name is Jean Paul Litz, and I'm here on behalf of the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. We represent the most highly skilled travel trades craft workers across the United States and Canada. We have long supported comprehensive investment in our nation's infrastructure, and we support the president's Build Back Better plan. And for us, building back better means building safer, cleaner, and smarter while protecting labor standards that lead to good paying jobs and support local economies. The bipartisan infrastructure package represents a good start and it provides much needed support for our roads, bridges, bridges, energy, water, and broadband. But we cannot neglect other vital infrastructure that is in desperate need of rebuilding. Investments in our vertical infrastructure, including schools, hospitals, and other government buildings is critically important and so is making sure they are energy efficient. We must do everything we can to ensure that those priorities are addressed in the budget reconciliation process. The average school is over 40 years old. According to a recently released GAO report, about half of school districts need repair or replace major systems like heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and plumbing. And about a third of schools need HVAC system updates. Schools are the second largest sector of public infrastructure in this country, yet one third of schools have portable buildings. The American Society of Civil Engineers gave school facilities a D plus rating while roads and bridges got a C minus. We owe it to students, teachers, and other school workers to make certain that our schools are safe and conducive to learning. The budget reconciliation process provides an historic opportunity to address this important priority. We recognize the challenges of reconciliation and know that many important policies are competing for limited funding provided in the reconciliation instructions. Operating within these challenges and limitations, the House Education Labor Committee allocated 82 billion to address school infrastructure needs. They estimate that this investment will create more than a million good paying jobs. We urge everyone to work to ensure that the Senate matches this commitment. This is a once in a generation opportunity to address this pressing need. Failure to act would be a tragedy. Thank you. Thank you, John Paul. Um, I wanna turn it over to uh, Richard Diaz from the Blue Green Alliance. Hey everyone, uh, I am not able to turn on my video, so I can just talk a little bit until we get that settled up. Uh, my name is Richard Diaz. I'm the Midwest Regional Field Organizer with Blue Green Alliance. Just a little bit about our organization. Uh, BGA unites labor unions and environmental organizations to solve today's environmental challenges in ways that create and maintain quality jobs and build a clean, thriving, and equitable economy. Some of our member organizations include United Steelworkers, uh, League of Conservation Voters, uh, International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, um, NRDC, and many other good environmental and labor unions um, who are all fighting for a uh, clean and fair economy. Uh, just to echo a little bit of what John Paul was saying, you know, every student, every teacher and worker in our school deserves a safe and healthy environment. And too many schools fail to live up to that most basic standard. Also, too often schools and hospitals and other public institutions are in disrepair and they're located in low income communities of color. Research shows that a percentage of students who qualify for reduced cost lunch increases um, the quality of their school and buildings decreases. In fact, the majority of schools identified as needing PCB remediation are in low income areas and communities of color, and that is just not acceptable. We need an infrastructure package that invests in our schools. And much like what JC mentioned, 
America's energy transition is well underway. And unless we make sure we take care of them, workers in their communities will bear the biggest costs as the United States transitions to a clean economy, which could potentially disrupt local economies and generational trades. Working people have too often felt the pain of shifts in technology. We can't leave workers or communities behind as these changes happen in our community. We are at a focal point in history where some major investments are coming down the line. And unless we have good paying union jobs to go along with them, workers will continue to be exploited like history shows us. A fair and equitable transition isn't something that will just happen organically. We have to choose to keep workers and communities whole, revitalize and diversify local economies and address racial inequities while ensuring the retention of and accessible pathways into good paying union jobs. For the United States to have an equitable transition, we have to ensure that that reconciliation package provides at least 32 billion for energy workers who may become dislocated. We also need to provide assistance for states and municipalities impacted by the transition and funding for infrastructure and economic programs in impacted regions. I'll close with this. Investments in infrastructure and manufacturing go hand in hand. With successful energy transition, these investments can provide a much needed jolt to local economies while delivering good job and public health and climate benefits to the community. They are also a critical foundation to further economic development and attract investments within these regions. I'd like to thank Illinois Environmental Council for inviting Blue Green Alliance to join you all here this evening. And I'll turn it back over to you, Brian. Thanks, Richard. Um, sorry, everyone, for just the uh, some of the technical video difficulties uh, in the age of Zoom events and meetings. Um, speaking of technical difficulties, our, our friends at the Environmental Defenders of McHenry County are having some issues as well. Um, they've been doing some incredible work organizing and advocating uh, for these issues uh, focused in McHenry County. Um, Carl Edstrom uh, from the board of the Environmental Defenders is, is on and um, will uh, try and make some remarks at the end um, if things are working out. But I encourage everyone to um, check out their website at uh, mcdef.org um, and uh, look for events to take part in and, and other, um, uh, uh, other things to get involved with, with the Environmental Defenders. They're a wonderful um, partner organization of ours and, uh, and on these issues. Um, I want to turn it over to Connie Schmidt uh, from the Sierra Club. Hi, everybody. Um... I'm honored to be uh, joining all these wonderful organizations that we've partnered with. Um, I'm a volunteer. I'm the volunteer chair of our executive board of directors. And most of you know about the Sierra Club. We are a national grassroots organization thriving with the volunteers from local municipalities to counties to state. Um, within Illinois, we are pretty proud that we can actually brag. We have a, as many as 300,000 members and supporters. People who have signed petitions and have become active with us. Within Illinois, there are 14 groups. And the groups that are aligned with uh, Lauren Underwood's district are our River Prairie group and our Valley of the Fox group. Um, that is one area where Sierra Club is different than some of the big statewide and national groups. We get involved in municipal organizations and or municipal issues, as well as county issues. Um, so that makes Sierra Club a little bit different. I have to tell you, we're here to talk about Lauren Underwood and energy and um, yay for Illinois and for the miraculous, hardworking three-year battle of pushing our clean energy bill over the line. So, so many of you are partners and I have to thank you so much for your letters, notes, texts, everything. Um, and speaking of um, energy issues, we are very pleased uh, Lauren Underwood has voted with us and we're, we're happy she has supported the federal um, budget resolution. She looks after our wilderness and wildlife areas. She was very good to sign on early for the America's Red Rock wilderness area that we were um, supporting in the Utah area. And we're really excited about engaging her support for the um, Biden's push for the reconciliation vote. So 
Thank you. I'm excited. The best thing I have to tell you, Lauren Underwood is my congressperson. So you see her picture behind me working for her for two years. I love stomping for this woman. Anyway, I'm very happy that um, we'll be able to chat with Lauren Underwood today. Thank you for having us, having us all here together. Thank you, Connie. Um, thank you to all our co-hosts. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Congresswoman Lauren Underwood of the Illinois 14th District. Um, Congresswoman, welcome. I will, I will turn it over to you uh, for a little bit. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Connie. So good to see <laughs> you. I am so excited to be with all of our advocates with the Illinois Environmental Council uh, tonight, and I appreciate all the organizing that you all have been doing. Um, I also want to thank the sponsor groups, the Environmental Defenders of McHenry County, the League of Conservation Voters, the Blue Green Alliance, NDR, NRDC, and the Sierra Club Illinois chapter. I am grateful to be here with all of you, and and I'm grateful to work with all of you um, as we work together to fight climate change and to protect our planet. Climate change is an emergency that demands urgent, bold action. And we cannot wait any longer and we can't settle for half measures. We're meeting tonight at a critical time to talk about the work that Congress needs to do to meet the moment and to ensure that humanity has a future, to put it mildly. Uh, a little sarcasm. Um, as we speak, Congress is working on historic legislation to tackle the climate crisis while making the largest long-term investment in our infrastructure and competitiveness in nearly a century. Right now, these bills are still very much being negotiated, but I'll tell you what we know so far and then give you a status update. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which already passed the Senate, would bring over $11 billion to Illinois to repair and rebuild our roads and bridges, over $1.7 billion to our state to improve water infrastructure, huge, and $4 billion to improve public transportation options across the state. The bipartisan package would also make the largest federal investment in public transit to modernize our transit system. It makes historic investments in electric vehicle charging infrastructure around the country. It delivers thousands of electric school buses nationwide, including in rural communities like those in my district, by helping school districts buy clean zero emissions buses. It makes the largest investment in the resilience of physical and natural systems in history, including our investments in water infrastructure to make our community safer and more resilient to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events. It also makes the largest investment in clean drinking water in American history. And finally, it makes the single largest investment in American history to upgrade our power infrastructure by building new transmission lines and facilitating the expansion of renewable energy. Now, in addition to the bipartisan bill, Congress is also in the process of developing a second bill. We call it the Build Back Better Act. And that's gonna deliver even more transformative benefits for our community. Now, you may have heard people talk about reconciliation. They talked about reconciliation earlier in the call, but we're gonna call it the Build Back Better Act, okay? Now, the House is taking the lead in developing this bill. So while it might change in the Senate, the House committees are focused and we are working on a version of the bill that would lower costs for middle-class families by expanding access to affordable childcare, establishing universal pre-K, providing two free years of community college and cutting taxes for those who buy their own health insurance. The current version of this bill, the Build Back Better Act, it also includes provisions from one of my own bills, the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act. Now, new research is showing a clear connection between climate change and serious adverse pregnancy outcomes like preterm birth, low birth rate, and stillbirth. My bill would direct federal funding towards community-based programs to mitigate exposure to environmental threats related to climate, the climate crisis that pose risks to babies and pregnant and postpartum patients. And I am thrilled that the Build Back Better Act may, may provide $85 million in funding for programs, including the ones in my bill to address the connection between climate change and our maternal health crisis. 
Now, the Build Back Better Act also has a key step towards reaching our climate goals by extending and expanding the clean energy tax credits that I know a lot of you are very excited about. It also incentivizes utilities for use of clean energy to accelerate progress towards clean electric grids at no added cost to consumers. Now that's key, right? We've seen some of our communities begin those investments and some of our communities, we feel it and we're, we're happy to make that investment, but this is different, no added cost to consumers. It creates grants to, and consumer rebates to support energy efficiency improvements, electrification and climate justice. Um, it uses federal procurement power to choose clean power and sustainable materials. And it puts Americans to work through a civilian climate corps dedicated to conserving our public lands and waters, bolstering community resilience and advancing environmental justice, all while paving the way for good paying union jobs. The bill researches the impacts of climate change on the farm economy and helps farmers adapt to a, claiming, a changing climate. It helps rural and low income communities transition to clean energy sources like solar power. It imposes a fee on methane pollution, which is obviously a potent greenhouse gas. And it creates a greenhouse gas reduction fund, which is modeled after successful state programs to invest in low and zero emission technologies. And it designates 40% of those investments for low income and disadvantaged communities. Now this is a lot, but I wanna just let you know what all's in the bill. The bill also provides billions of dollars in environmental justice grants to decrease pollution and improve public health in communities that are most impacted by climate change and other harms. Um, there's funding to clean up our contaminated Superfund sites. And together with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we will be replacing lead service lines throughout the country, including right here in Illinois, to ensure that every child in America can, can drink clean drinking water. So these are a lot of much needed benefits um, that are gonna be coming our way through both bills. And I'm certainly committed to getting both passed through Congress and over to President Biden um, as soon as possible. Now, right now, there are a lot of committees working in the House to really figure out these details um, in their respective sections of the Build Back Better Act. Um, some of these committees finished writing their sections last week. Some are working this week to finish them up. Um, once each committee has approved its own section of the bill, then the whole House will vote on the entire Build Back Better Act. And the goal is for the House of Representatives to pass both the Build Back Better Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act by the end of this month. So we're really talking about a time horizon of like four weeks for action in the House. And I am so excited about these transformative investments in our climate and in our community. I look forward to continuing to be in touch as this process continues. But in the meantime, if you live in the Illinois 14th District and you have ideas and opinions about the types of investments that are most important to you and the things that you wanna make sure that I know about, I wanna hear from you. And so please contact my office to let me know what's on your mind. And if you don't live in the 14th District, reach out to your representative and let them know about your priorities. Now, finally, I want to let you know about some of the other legislation that I've been working on to address climate change and other environmental issues impacting our community. I've already mentioned my Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act, which I am so excited is being considered for inclusion in, the, in this bill, the Build Back Better Act. But another bill that I'm leading that you should know about is the Climate and Health Protection Act. Now, this bill would strengthen and grow the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC's Office on Climate and Health, which helps our states and our local communities, um, especially the public health departments, prepare for the public health impacts on climate change. Now, both bills are focused on mitigating the impacts of climate change that we know are inevitable and they're already happening, but it's important to also um, tackle these root causes of climate change to stop things from getting worse. And that's why we introduced a bill called the Farmers Fighting Climate Change Act 
which would allow farmers to be reimbursed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture for implementing sustainable ag practices that pull carbon out the atmosphere or that reduce emissions. And I am so proud that so many of our Northern Illinois farmers are already doing this work. I'm so grateful that the Illinois Environmental Council uh, supported this bill and joined me for the press conference when I introduced it on a farm in Samanac. Now we've also passed legislation to help ensure that vital federal research and information on climate change that's published by the US Department of Agriculture remains fully available to the American public. And we're gonna to continue to fight for policies like these that take strong action against climate change. Now, I know that unfortunately climate change isn't the only environmental issue affecting our communities. Some of our constituents do live in communities that emit ethylene oxide, which is an air pollutant that causes cancer. And every American, no matter where they live, deserves to know that the air that they breathe is safe. And that's why I'm a member of the Congressional Ethylene Oxide Task Force and why I've been fighting for better regulation and oversight of air pollution by the Environmental Protection Agency. And you all may know this, I don't know, um, but I'm a new member of the Appropriations Committee. And there we've been really pushing for funding for the EPA to increase its monitoring and compliance activities for ethylene oxide. And I'm so proud that that provision in particular was included in this year's um, FY22 uh, funding bill that passed the House. And we're gonna keep pushing to make sure it stays in the bill as it works through the Senate and gets to the president. So I gave you a lot. We can dig into as much of it as you want in the QA, but thank you for joining the call tonight to talk about how we can build a healthier and more sustainable future for our community. And I am delighted to take whatever questions you have. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, Colleen beat, beat, beat me to it in the chat. We are really happy to have uh, a champion on these issues like you on the Appropriations Committee. Thanks. Um, since these virtual events can be a little clunky, as you know, we've seen from uh, some of our video issues, um, we had folks submit questions ahead of time, um, and we sort of composited them when there were a few overlapping um, types of questions. So I'm going to read uh, questions on behalf of our uh, attendees um, to go through uh, all of their questions for you. Sounds good. So the first question, and you you um, talked about it some already, um, was just on kind of an update on where things stand with these bills. Um, you mentioned there's markups going through the house and you gave kind of a, a timeline for the rest of uh, house goings on. Is there anything else you wanted to add there of, of just how that works uh, once, you know, once the house does what they're supposed to do? Yeah, all I would just say is don't be discouraged. There's a lot of negotiating happening through the press, a lot of posturing, a lot of people trying to flex and seem like really important. At the end of the day, we are committed to taking action and getting these bills across the finish line. We know negotiations are tough, um, but we also know how urgent action is. And so um, I'm grateful to have you all as partners in this work, and we're just going to stay close. Um, so if you get action alerts coming from whatever organization you're affiliated with, don't wait, right? They're going to send that action alert, and they need you to reach out to folks. Um, and so just, you know, kind of stand by for that kind of cadence, because this is happening very rapidly, and we are having these conversations in real time. Thank you for that. Earlier, you mentioned a couple of bills you're working on in response to the health effects of climate change. Um, one of the questions we got was, what do you see as climate change's biggest threats to people's health? Uh, and I know you talked about a couple of bills, but um, what can we do to prepare for this? I mean, literally, how much time do we have? We have <laughs> seen this play out over and over and over, community by community, and I can't think of any place in the United States that hasn't been touched uh, in terms of a healthcare impact on climate change. It is literally a disaster. We have natural disasters, right? And so climate change is making our natural disasters more severe and more frequent. We're talking about bigger storms, bigger floods, bigger wildfires, and so on. I mean, people are literally getting injured, they're dying. Um, but obviously the impacts are bigger than that. People are losing their homes. We're seeing folks being put into really precarious situations that make it difficult for them to access their routine healthcare services. Um, 
We're seeing people who are being exposed to unsanitary water during floods, right? Um, people miles away from these wildfires out west are inhaling smoke and poor quality air. And then there's always this wave of mental health trauma after the natural disaster, right? It is, it is predictable at this point, the wave of grief and trauma um, and, you know, quite frankly, um, you know, psychiatric crises that arise after these natural disasters. So that's just one. Then we have extreme heat, right? Climate change is so dangerous outside of the disasters too. Now, one of the most obvious impacts is that a lot of places are literally getting hotter. We're seeing urban heat islands. We're seeing more heat emergencies. Um, and those heat emergencies can be deadly for people who are unhoused, for example, people living without air conditioning, the elderly, people with underlying health conditions. Um, and obviously extreme heat poses ex serious risks, I would say, for people with pregnancy complications. And that's where we really did our work with the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act. Air pollution, another issue uh, with direct health impacts. Uh, the warming climate associated with climate change is also making other environmental hazards more dangerous like air pollution. And so we're seeing higher levels of airborne mold and other allergens, for instance. And a lot of the same emissions that will accelerate climate change um, are also increasing um, and they're oftentimes deadly in terms of the particular the particulate uh, matter that's in the air and uh, contributing to those folks who have underlying healthcare conditions. Uh, climate change is impacting agriculture, the flooding that we see, our farmers will talk your ear off about these floods and the impacts on their business, uh, the temperature changes and so on. It's threatening our food supply and we know how important nutrition is to public health. Uh, things like the natural disasters and famines are literally driving people out of their homes. And so we are starting to see waves of climate refugees who lack access to secure housing, to sanitation, and so on. Uh, we're seeing shifts in our ecosystems with global repercussions. So for example, wild animals are being displaced by extreme weather and they're relocating to areas that they never lived in before, which can expose people to new diseases. Um, and that's being exacerbated by un unsustainable um, like home and commercial developments, which brings humans into more frequent contact with wildlife in ways that, you know, really increase the risk of what we call spillover events that create new diseases. And I think that we're all really getting to be pretty familiar with those at this point, and it's scary. And then finally, all of that is before we get to the ways that climate change decimates our global economy. And, um, you know, I think that people are really widely starting to recognize poverty itself as a fundamental cause of disease that will be made worse by climate change. So there are a lot of really serious public health risks um, associated with climate change. And so we are taking action to prepare. Um, and one of the ways that we can do this is by investing in public health itself, right? Climate change is a public health threat. I think that we can all acknowledge that right now. And so we need to be expecting to see a public health response from our healthcare professionals and giving them those resources that they need to prepare. And so that's where my Climate and Health Protection Act comes in to strengthen that CDC program, providing funding, um, expert guidance to state and local officials and other resources to help those agencies literally prepare for the impacts it'll have on their communities. I described our protecting moms and babies from uh, Climate Change Act earlier. Um, to address the maternal health risks of extreme heat and air pollution. By the way, this is an evidence-based policy that literally we saw an article in JAMA and then we wrote the bill, right? So we know what to do and how to save lives here. We just have to be courageous enough to take congressional action on that point. Finally, the other way that we can stop climate change from hurting people is to, hello, actually stop climate change. And so it's really important to address these root causes in addition to investing in public health, investing in resilience, investing in adapt ad adaptation and other you know, related measures. And so that's where our Farmers Fighting Climate Change Act comes in to empower and incentivize our farmers to shift to more sustainable agriculture methods, to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And then of course, 
the two bills that we're here talking about, the Infrastructure Bill and the Build Back Better Act, which have so many important provisions um, and you know, critically important dollars um, to transform our economy and protect our climate from the most severe changes. And you know, let's just be clear, this may be our last chance our last chance to prevent some of the worst outcomes. And so we need both bills and we need them right now. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned resiliency. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions uh, we received was with the impacts we've seen from floods, storms and wildfires and other extreme weather events all across the country, how do we ensure we build more climate resilient infrastructure going forward? I mean, we literally know what to do, right? The science and the evidence is there in terms of, you know, the materials to use, the construction measures, you know, and, and I think that communities are really excited about taking action. They just need the resources. You know, I represent um, a suburban and rural area here in Northern Illinois. I have teeny, 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 tiny communities like Lisbon and Newark and Kendall County. And then the second largest city in the state, Aurora, Illinois. And both, on both ends of that spectrum, the communities are excited about these resources to build in that resilience. Um, and so, you know, the incredible part about these bills is that these investment dollars will stretch um, to touch every community, creating jobs that um, we really can build that kind of expertise that people can um, create whole careers on. And these jobs can't be exported. Right. So people will be doing the work right here in our communities, becoming an expert. And that's where the resilience and sustainability comes in as well. We need a resilient workforce. Right. We need that kind of um, 21st century modern economic um, firepower. And these bills also with the workforce investments enable us to do that. Thank you. Um, next question uh, was on uh, clean energy jobs. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk more about what Congress needs to do to create more of these clean energy jobs? Um, what benefits do those bring to our community and how can they help us create a more equitable economy? Yes. So I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but truly the most important thing that we can do right now is pass these bills, right? These bills will have a monumental impact on our economy. Uh, we're talking about creating jobs, uh, you know, obviously investing in clean energy, climate resilience, environmental justice, and the fundamental social services uh, included in these bills, I mean, it's just unprecedented. And so the benefits to our communities are countless. Um, and one of the benefits that I'm super jazzed about is um, the equity piece. So our economy doesn't just need companies and jobs to function, right? It also depends on transit options to get people to and from work. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't live in communities that have effective, accessible transit options. Our economy also depends on social services, things like childcare that are essential for working pa parents, but it's too expensive for a lot of families and out of reach, right? And unfortunately, the burdens of those types of gaps are not distributed equally across our society. It's usually people of color, it's usually women and other marginalized folks who have the toughest time. And so when we invest in our physical infrastructure and when we invest in our social services and make sure that it literally reaches everyone, then everybody has a fair shot and can participate in our economy, you know, grow their uh, skills and talents and contribute. And so this is what I'm so excited about is that this thread of equity is literally throughout the entire Build Back Better Act. And um, I think it's a reflection of our values. You beat me to our, our what was going to be the next question, which was about um, environmental justice and yeah. um, ensuring President Biden's Justice 40 commitments are met. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add there on kind of the environmental justice portions of these bills? Um, 
Well, I mean, I just think it's really important. It's not the aspect that's getting a lot of headlines, but I think it's um, an aspect that will make a big impact. I mean, the environment and climate justice block grants, um, right now the committee is considering funding those at five billion, billion with a B dollars. And those like go directly towards reducing pollution and improving climate resilience in those communities that are most impacted by climate change. So, you know, um, if we can have a real talk conversation, right? We know what segregated communities look like. Chicago is a segregated community. And oftentimes it's those communities of color that are right in um, the shadows of some kind of industrial plant or right in the shadows of some kind of other environmental contaminant. And if those communities um, traditionally hadn't had the resources to, to make those mitigating changes to help um, build their resilience and uh, to literally clean up, right? And now we're making those dollars available at an amount that makes a huge investment all across the country. I mean, it's just significant. And that's what makes me excited about it. We're not just throwing out words like environmental justice, right? There is a real investment here um, that shows that we are serious about this threat of equity that's um, that's going through the entire legislation. So that's one place I would suggest looking. And the other is this civilian climate core. And so, you know, one of the jobs, one of the things that folks will be doing once this legislation is passed, if people sign up to work with their civilian climate core, is to literally clean up pollution in these frontline communities. Um, and then obviously we all know the impact of lead service lines, um, in particular uh, our communities of color and especially here in Illinois. And I think that, you know, again, we kind of take for granted when there's construction happening and people are like, oh, there's a water line replacement, like whatever. They don't get excited when the actual construction is happening, but these have a huge impact on communities. Um, and, you know, it just is going to make a world of difference. I'm so pumped. You, you, uh, once again, you, you, you beat me to my next question, um, which is uh, on lead service lines. Okay. Um, and and it, there, there has been some uh, developments, I think, since um, late last week when this this question was uh, submitted. Um, but the question is, experts say it will take 45 to 60 billion dollars mm -hmm. to replace all of the nation's lead uh, drinking water service lines. Right. However, there's 15 billion for lead service lines in the infrastructure bill. Um, Illinois the bipartisan, has more the bipartisan infrastructure bill bipartisan infrastructure bill, excuse right. me. Mm -hmm. Illinois has more of these lead service lines than any other state in the country. That's right. And I, their, their question is, can we add more money for this in uh, the Build Back Better Act? Or they had said the reconciliation bill. Yes. So um, here's the deal. We all know, because we watched the drama unfold with that Senate negotiation with their bipartisan deal. Um, those folks were less jazzed about really doing the work on replacing lead service lines. I said it. Um, however, um, we do have an opportunity to uh, include the full amount that we had authorized in our Invest in America Act when it passed the House in July. Uh, we're gonna put the remaining 30 billion into the Build Back Better Act. And um, that's what the committees are working on as we speak. Um, and so, yes. I think that we are going to have a Build Back Better Act that completes the job in terms of having offering the full funding so that states like ours, communities that we serve, um, can um, rest assured that every lead pipe in America can be replaced and that the funding is available to do that. Wonderful. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more yeah. pretty quick ones before we wrap up. Um, uh, a few people had uh, submitted questions about electric vehicle infrastructure, okay. um, uh, and and um, and and the the grid. <laughs> um, what priority is being placed on a national uh, charging electric grid that includes superchargers for electric vehicles, um, placing mandates for car manufacturers to transition sooner to electric vehicles? I think in general, a number of folks, and not surprisingly in Illinois, um, we're curious about some of the electric vehicle provisions that are being discussed. 
Yes, it's very exciting. So we know that the fossil fuel power cars are huge contributors, not just to climate change, but also air pollution that's responsible for so many public health issues, right? So electrifying our automotive sector is a huge priority. Um, and the Build Back Better Act includes $13.5 billion, again, that's with a B, for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, and we know that the lack of these charging stations is a major reason why drivers across the country were hesitant about switching to EVs. Um, Consumer Reports put out a survey that said that the number one change we could make to inspire people to go electric is to add more public charging stations along highways. And that's why the Build Back Better Act um, is so important because it helps to build the consumer confidence which will then drive up sales of these electric vehicles, right? It's doing the work to then provide an incentive. And so uh, we are also including some important financial incentives for consumers to make the switch. So right now the bill has a very generous tax credit of $7,500 for a consumer who purchases an electric vehicle placed into service before January of 2027. And then the credit gets even more generous to $12,500. That's huge. For those who purchase an electric vehicle that is has its final assembly here in the United States in a facility that operates under a union negotiated collective bargaining agreement and uses US made batteries, right? So it's huge. The potential for an American consumer to decide to purchase a new vehicle, get a $12,500 tax credit, knowing for sure that this is completely made in the USA, <laughs> using workers that are getting fair wages and great benefits is, I mean, talk about values alignment, right? It is so important. Now, the Build Back Better Act also includes uh, additional funding for the EPA to help to replace some of the heavy duty vehicles like school buses with the zero emission vehicles. And the president just signed an executive order a couple weeks ago that set the goal of electric vehicles comprising half of all new cars by 2030. So we are serious when we say we want these um, incentives to be in place. Um, and I know that the federal agencies are working to accelerate this transition. Thank you. I, I know at least uh, JC and I and a few other folks from uh, our co-host organizations sat uh, with Gina McCarthy recently um, and talked about uh, the Clean Cars Executive Order and the upcoming rules. So um, thank you for, for walking through that. Yeah. I think we've just got a couple more quick ones. Um, okay. and, and before I ask just our final question, are, are, there, are there any other pieces of legislation or anything else you wanna talk about or let people know about while we have you? Yeah, you know, the only thing I just really want to say is that, you know, a lot of the criticism that I'm hearing and that folks are throwing around in the press is, you know, how we pay for it. And one of the things that I think is so important about this legislation is that it's paid for. And so right now, our Ways and Means Committee is literally working on their portion of the bill that will hold those corporate, you know, tax evaders accountable by making sure that they are contributing <laughs> to our country and, you know, the wealthiest Americans are paying their fair share. Um, and I think that that's what's so exciting about this kind of investment, right? We are, we are uh, making sure that we're not raising taxes on families making less than 400,000 a year. Um, and the legislation actually cuts taxes for working families by extending this child tax credit, right? By making healthcare costs uh, more affordable for families. And it puts more money in the pockets of Americans who need it most by like lowering prescription drug prices and childcare expenses, right? And so this is just like a win-win Win, win for middle class working families in our country. I know a lot of folks hear dollar amounts, you know, thrown out in the press and they like recoil. Um, but don't be swayed by these, you know, scare tactics offered by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are just critical out of bad faith, have no intention on taking action on climate. And let's stay focused on getting the job done to make sure that we are able to make these key investments. And then just lastly, what, what can we as you know, pro-environment supporters, as activists, as 
environmental professionals? What can we do in the coming weeks and months to push for maximum federal investment and good environmental policies uh, as, at this crucial time? Okay, so here's the deal. We need to hear from you. And it's not just a one-way conversation from you to us. We need you to be talking to your neighbors, to your church groups, to your neighborhood association, to all your Facebook friends, but one post is not enough, okay? We need people to know the impact of this legislation and why you're so excited about it, right? It's so easy for people to say, oh my God, climate change is my number one issue. And then their eyes glaze over when we talk about these key investments. People need to know about how we are delivering on these key investments that we know will be transformative on the goals that we all share about reducing carbon emissions, the goals that we all share about saving lives and hello, saving money. Like, this is great for, I mean, for middle-class folks like us, this is huge. And so literally, please, please, please just keep talking about it. You know, my colleagues need to hear from you. The senators need to hear from you, right? Tweeting at us is not actually doing it, right? Like pick up the phone and make a call, you know, send an email, write a letter, put a stamp on it. Hello, you guys know what to do. Um, request meetings, whatever, but, um, I know a lot of folks get jazzed about the accountability energy, right? Like, I thought you were gonna vote for this and you didn't. That has a time and place. This is not the accountability energy. This is the let's get it done energy. And a lot of folks don't like to show up when it's time to get it done. We need you, okay? So thanks for all you do. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your efforts on these issues. Um, if anyone has questions that didn't get answered, which I, I know there are some because I'm um, sitting at a, looking at a list of some of them, you can go to underwood.house.gov um, and have more uh, and reach out to the Congresswoman and her team um, who can help uh, get some of those questions answered. Um, we're gonna stick around for just a couple minutes and, and have a few more words from our hosts, but Congresswoman, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Appreciate and remember, time. guys, the pandemic's not done, okay? So please take good care of yourselves. We need you to take advantage of the opportunity to be vaccinated, wear your masks, and help protect these kids that we all love, okay? Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, really excited to, to hear what Congresswoman Underwood has to say. Um, while we've still got folks for uh, the time being, uh, do any of our hosts have any events or initiatives or programs, social media, anything they want to promote? Um, how can folks uh, attending tonight's event um, get involved uh, through your organizations? I will open it up to our, our panelists. Connie, you can go first. Hi. Um, Sierra Club is promoting a hike with Jenny Yang Roar this Saturday from three to five. We're meeting in Naperville at Knock Knowles. Uh, Nature Center, and she welcomes us to talk about issues that are important to us here in Illinois. So how great that she reached out to initiate this event. Uh, we have an events calendar on our website, uh, Illinois, uh, this just this Illinois chapter Sierra Club. Wonderful. Thank you, Connie. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, um, and Illinois Environmental Council, if you go to ilenviro.org, um, also has um, action alerts and um, a ton of information on both our blog and um, on our issue pages. So um, we encourage folks to uh, sign on, get involved. Thank you everyone for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the event um, and feel free to reach out to uh, any of our organizations for uh, more information. Bye and have a great night.